It's my privilege to now introduce as our next speaker and truth teller, Anne Wright. Anne was in the US Army for 29 years and, and she retired as a Colonel. She was also a US diplomat for 16 years and worked in nine embassies, including reopening the US embassy in Afghanistan in 2001. She resigned from the US government 18 years ago in 2003 in opposition to the US war on Iraq. Since 2003, she has worked for peace around the world through delegations to North Korea, Iran, Gaza, Afghanistan, Yemen, Pakistan, Cuba, Vietnam, Russia, China, South Korea, Japan, and Malaysia. And you really get around. And thanks for all you do. And you're on, Anne. Aloha from the occupied nation of Hawaii, one of the victims of US imperialism 120 years ago. Um, I was uh, on, you know, on many Zoom calls today, and they were they were very poignant because they were talking about the Cold War that we have today, and one of them was a two-hour conversation with women from uh, the Asian countries that are that are here in Hawaii and from Hawaiians. You know, Hawaii is, ha probably has the most uh, uh, diverse ethnic di diverse population in the country where. Uh, the majority, like 90% of the people that live in this state are of Asian uh, background. And they are worried, even here in Hawaii, uh, they're worried about the Cold War that we are now facing, that we are in the midst of, where Asians are being uh, brutalized on the streets and murdered in, in their places of work. I also was on uh, another call with an old friend from 20 years ago. She worked in the U.S. Embassy in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan in Central Asia, but she was, she's an ethnic Russian, but had lived in Kyrgyzstan all of her life, as all the Central Asian countries had a lot of ethnic Russians that lived there. She immigrated to the United States about 15 years ago, and as a, a you know, a new immigrant, I said, well, are you uh, suffering any of this new Cold War where, you know, the President of the United States is calling the, the uh, calling Putin a murderer and, you know, all of the stuff that's been going on. And she said, well, yeah, we are. The Russian population in Portland, Oregon is feeling the effects of yet another Cold War. Uh, so there we are, a Cold War 40 years, 30 years after the last one kind of finished. You know, I go back uh, 60 years uh, to the Cold War back in the 50s. Uh, I got acquainted with the Cold War through the Methodist Church because the Methodist Church decided they would bring in the National Guard leader and he would every Sunday night, he'd tell all of us kids about the Cold War that we'd better be scared of and that we'd better join the military. Well, I did. And as Frank mentioned, I stayed in an awful long time and then was a US diplomat for, for the empire. So I have not been a part of this wonderful group um, that has been speaking for hours now about all of the, uh, well, you've been speaking about a lot of the stuff that I was maybe not involved in, but I was certainly in the government during the time that a lot of this was going on. And I'm so grateful to all of the, these groups, whether Code Pink, Vets for Peace, Peace Action, uh, that once I resigned, you took me in, you educated me, you gave me a really good education on what U.S. history was. And I've been trying my best to uh, uh, live up to the opportunity to really call out what the what the U.S. is doing. And in this new Cold War that we have, I, I just want to mention what's going on out here in the Pacific. And I know that Jody's going to be coming on in just a few minutes to talk specifically about China. Uh, but I just wanted to mention that, you know, there the, the things that we do have, like on March 1st, we set, we had a commemoration here in Honolulu about the um, the largest nuclear weapon that the United States ever tested, which was during the Castle Bravo uh, test in the Marshall Islands, where a, a weapon that was 1,000 times more powerful than the weapon that was dropped on Hiroshima and on Nagasaki. Uh, it brings to mind that the United States is still just spending like crazy on developing, uh, continuing to develop nuclear weapons and having new uh, plants that are built for these nuclear weapons. 
uh, the, the new strategy that the U.S. has for the Western Pacific and for Asia uh, includes, uh, you know, an inordinate amount of crazy spending. Right now, we in Hawaii are, are battling back a $1.9 billion homeland radar that wouldn't even work if they get it built. It's not even built for the types of weaponry that's going to be, if there is actually uh, confrontation with other countries, this radar wouldn't work anyway. But it just shows the, the military congressional industrial complex where our congressional delegation here in Honolulu in, in Hawaii uh, is battling desperately for this $1.9 billion to come in uh, to the Hawaiian Islands to build this, uh, this uh, uh, radar that won't work. Uh, we're also the headquarters of the Indo-Pacific Command, which has the military purview of all of the Pacific and then all the way over into India. And the strategy that U.S. military forces are, are developing uh, for a potential, and now they're even calling it a war with China. You know, normally, uh, U.S. wording is a little more delicate than that. But now we're having actually the phrasing of a war with China, which is so scary, so disturbing, because right now we're having confrontations in the Western Pacific where we have armadas of U.S. naval ships that are in the South China Sea that are doing what, what the U.S. calls the freedom of navigation exercises, which are really war maneuvers of sending a lot of ships in through the South China Sea and weaving them among the islands where actually the Chinese have built uh, military installations on atolls, uh, uh, on coral areas, and then they've built them up. Uh, and they have their, their military on these islands. Then we're sending our military into it. And then the, the Trump administration, having uh, decided that it would change the policy of the U.S. from the last 45 years of, of kind of non-recognition of Taiwan officially, but of course we have dealings with them, well, the Trump administration sent in all the highest level U.S. government officials that had been in Taiwan in 40 years, and that made the, the uh, PRC mad. And so all of a sudden, then we had an armada of aircraft that were flying from uh, the mainland of China right to the edge of the air defense zone of Taiwan. So the things that are happening out here in the Pacific are very, very scary. It's a uh, it is uh, like it's a continuation, as Bruce Gagnon mentioned uh, in his presentation about NATO and that the NATO, NATO is spreading in different directions and it's coming out here into the Pacific. The four partners of NATO, which are Australia, New Zealand, uh, Japan and South Korea, uh, uh, have been working with the United States on countering uh, China. Uh, the, Europe, the NATO uh, hierarchy has now put out a statement, you know, that China is a threat to even NATO in the North Atlantic. One of the reasons being that the Chinese, who are very smart people and who decide that any sort of confrontation or challenge doesn't have to be military, it can be economic. And so they've been building roads all through Asia, all through Africa. They've been uh, getting leases on uh, ports. Uh, they have leases on uh, parts of like 30 ports in Europe and the Mediterranean, and they even have some leases on some ports in the United States. So there is a definite challenge that China has, but they're, even though they are increasing their military, but not nearly to the extent uh, that the U.S. has, and only one third of the amount of money put on uh, as their military budget. Uh, but you know, in order for our military industrial complex and congressional complex to have a way to spend U.S. taxpayers' money uh, for their own benefit, you need to have threats. So now we have them, both the Russians and the Chinese. So that's the report from out here in the Pacific. And we want to thank you all very, very much for organizing this marathon <laughs> that, that you've been doing. Thanks so much. Peace in the world. Aloha. Ooh, thank you, Anne. Yes, it's a marathon. <laughs> we are spending the day putting the Cold War on trial. That is for sure. 
Well, wonderful. Thank you so much for your testimony, and it will be put in the record. Our next uh, testifier uh, is Jody Evans, and thank you so much for being here. She is the co-founder of Code Pink, Women for Peace, and campaign coordinator for China is Not Our Enemy. She has been a visionary advocate for peace for several decades. Whether in boardrooms or war zones, legislative offices or neighborhood streets, Jody's enthusiasm for a world at peace infuses conciliation, optimism, and activism wherever she goes. And she's a very, very generous woman who opens up her home to have the Code Pink LA meetings there. Very much appreciated. Jody, your testimony. Thank you, Rachel, um, for this brilliant organizing. Of course, uh, you, Frank, for being just the rock star, tireless peace activist and organizer you are. I'm blown away by this day. Thank you for inviting me uh, to talk about China and their history. I want to start with a little Vijay Prashad, who also warns that something gets lost in calling it a Cold War instead of naming it as an aggression directed from the US foreign policy that desires to rule the world. So call it by its name, barbaric imperialism. I was living part-time in China before COVID changed our capacities to travel and living there made me hyper aware of the propaganda of hate and lies that was flowing from scores of media sources toward China. It felt very familiar to the early days of the push for war in Iraq. That propaganda has already brought a war against Asians in the streets of the United States. This is a truth commission and there has been so much truth and beauty shared today. I want to start by saying the names of the victims of the war this week that happened on the anniversary of the Mei Lai massacre. Soon Chung Park, Hyun Jung Grant, Soon Cha Kim, Young A. Ye, Delania Ashley Yon, Paul Andre Michaels, Chao Ji Tan, Dayo Feng. May you rest in peace and love. There have been over 3,000 other attacks that have taken place in the last year, and Code Pink has been raising concerns about the Asian hate this propaganda is driving. We have a national call to action March 27th with a big coalition of groups. It's across the country. We hope you will join us. I'll put the links in the chat, including reaching out to Kamala Harris and the White House about ending their hateful language towards China. So that the desire to crush China is not new and we in the United States know little about China. So that's my offering today. The opposite of hate is love, which is compassion, and to be with another is to know a bit about them. We think of ourselves as affluent in the US, but we are impoverished Americans in our understanding of the world. Imperialist desires to own China go back to the opium wars of 1839. It starts with England wanting to dismantle China after raping and pillaging India. This is also the first invasion of Afghanistan control the region by European powers so let's begin with the awareness that China has experienced imperialist terror for a very long time. Before the Opium Wars in 1837, China represented 25% of global GDP and Beijing was larger than London. After World War II in 1949, China represented 5% global GDP and was one of the 10 poorest countries in the world. In China, World War II started in 1937 with the Marco Polo Bridge Incident, the beginning of the Second Sino-Japanese War. This is when the axis between Germany, Italy, and Japan were executing their plan to hit the Soviet Union from the East and West and crush China to take over the world. Before 1939, you can read in US foreign policy documents that they hoped Germany would take out Soviet Union and Japan would take out China. It's interesting to note that at this time, both the US and Germany are giving military to support to the KMT in China. And Goebbels, who's a big supporter of Chiang Kai-shek, also had um, Chiang Kai-shek's son working for him in Germany. What few Americans know is that many Chinese died, as many Chinese died as Russians in World War II. They say around 27 million Soviets died 
and over 20 million Chinese died. There was also barbaric scientific research and biological warfare that was carried out on the Chinese by Japanese. At a museum in Harbin, China, there are photos of Japanese science literally executing barbaric acts, um, in, infecting living human beings with this biological warfare and leaving them standing in meadows until they succumb to the effects and then burying them there. Those scientists went back to become the leading scientists in Japan. I bring this up in light of the quad Blinken gathered this week to remind us these alliances have a long history and how China might feel toward Japan. Another atrocity most Americans are not aware of is the rape of Nanjing in 1937, which also came to light in a war crimes tribunal, but that was in 1947. As we heard earlier, there was no need to drop the atomic bombs on Japan as surrender was near. This was also true in China. Nanjing had surrendered, but the Japanese entered. And in the next six weeks, somewhere between 300,000 were beheaded, raped, and subjected to barbaric violence. The loss of life close to that of the dropping of atomic bombs. Between the time of the Opium Wars and the Korean War, 100 million Chinese died in war at the hands of Europeans, American, Japanese, and internal civil wars. A century of invasion and violence. In 1949, China was 450 million citizens. That means more than 15% of their population had died. Just imagine that. They know this as the century of humiliation. Then China gets pulled into the US war in Korea. The barbarism and insanity of the US war in Korea is wretched and also not well known. I encourage you to follow the women cross the DMZ as this is another violence against humanity by US foreign policy. But it was also a huge price paid by China. None of the generals in China wanted to support the Workers Party of North Korea. They knew it was a bloodbath that no one could win and preferred to wait until the US was at their borders where they felt they could be more defensive. They are defensive in temperament and training. But Mao had a commitment to internationalism, a commitment to others. Who are you if you abandon your friends, those who have stood with you? He knew it was a big risk and it could have been the end of China. It was the end of his son who died in the battles with the US and North Korea, a huge and painful price. China had no tanks and no airplanes and this was a loss of another million people. Here is when Sino-US relations fall apart because of China's support of the Workers' Party in Korea. And when it's over, the US sanctions against China are launched and also they block China from becoming a member of the UN. My friend Georgia Kelly at Praxis for Peace Institute had security clearance in the 60s working on war papers at Stanford where she read the intention of the US to isolate Afghanistan, Shenzhen, Tibet, Hong Kong and Taiwan as tools to take over China. These reports start back in the 50s. Shenzhen has long been under the effects of US infiltration, including a request to the King of Saudi Arabia to bring Wahhabism to the Uyghurs, something the King even spoke about as strange. There was a plan to take over China and we saw in these documents later a question, who lost China? imperialist language in itself as if they owned it priorly. Um, they felt that because Mao didn't like Stalin, they could do what they always do as um, colonialists, divide and conquer. But here's where American foreign policy failed. Also, the British had wanted Tibet since the end of the 1800s, invading Tibet in an attempt to pull it away from China. But they were not interested in national liberation for the Tibetan people, but colonizing them than Tibet, a theocracy um, with slaves. The infiltration of Tibet by the CIA is what provoked China's pushback. The CIA Tibetan program was a nearly two decades long anti-Chinese covert operation focused on Tibet, which consisted of political action, propaganda, paramilitary and intelligence operations based on US government arrangements made with the brothers of the 14th Dalai Lama and it states to keep the political concept of an autonomous Tibet alive within Tibet. This ended with Nixon's visit to China. Taiwan, there's no dispute, is Chinese territorial, um, under Chinese territorial control. 
But the US wants to use Taiwan as a base for military engagement and economic interests. Basically, it's Miami next to China. China's stuck. It can't allow US missiles sitting in Taiwan. How long did JFK allow Cuba to keep those missiles? You know, China sees it has 1.5 billion citizens to take care of, and it is not going to sit back and let US aggression bring military presence closer to China. Cold War? This is part of a bigger international issue, and we've heard a bit about this today, but if the US crushes China, it cripples the fight of people of the global south for possibly centuries. It cuts off progress for other ways to live together on this planet, and for many would cut off hope for the human race and life on Earth. A wave came from the West and destroyed everything, lives, culture, community, connectivity, and the health of the planet. We live in the dark times of this effect. We live in the belly of this beast. We need the wind that comes from the East to rebuild infrastructure and heal and create peace. European white maritime expansion started in 1492 to today with 500 years of European terror and white supremacy. Yet there was a Silk Road based on trade instead of war. Not the Europeans concept of trade, which was slave trade, but the exchanging of wares and creation. It is what we see from China, an extension of the Silk Road. The question of how do we construct trade in a mutually beneficial way? Under the leadership of the CPC, China is the only country in recent decades that has become the world's second largest economy without resorting to warfare, colonialism, or slavery. For more than 10 consecutive years, China has contributed to over 30% of global GDP growth. 850 million people have been lifted out of poverty. China is the second largest contributor to the UN and has sent more than 40,000 UN peacekeeping personnel outnumbering other permanent members of the Security Council. The CPC also enjoys the highest rate of support and satisfaction from the Chinese people, over 90% according to the latest Harvard study. Another fact about China is it has had strong central government for 2,200 years with a responsibility to society and a concern for the whole. So let us call this what it is, another boondoggle for the Pentagon and the weapons industry to distract, destabilize, destroy, and clean out the funds in the US needed to invest in a functioning society. We must change the narrative. No money for war. Funds need to be redirected to the needs of the people. Cut military spending, at least in security, death, and destruction. Yes to respecting human rights, starting with our own behaviors. We must not be used by the propaganda. It is being directed at the progressives and the lefts. We cannot spread hate. We must spread compassion. We cannot spread lies, but truth. We at Code Pink are here to help with tools, actions, and teachings. You can find them at Code Pink's China is not our enemy. We have to be fierce in the face of Biden's foreign policy as it is still mostly Trump's. I'll post ways to engage in the chat. And I thank you for attending, for your passion for peace. Onward. Wow. Thank you, Jody. Very beautiful testimony. Thank you so much. And and um, for those of us in the LA area or even the west of the United States, here we are um, benefiting financially from trade with China, yet allowing um, all of this anti-China hate. And so, Jody, your talk, we've talked about this a little bit, but I, I'm recommitted, I say right now on this call, to reaching out to the ILWU and the union um, that benefits so much from the trade with China and and there's crickets when it comes to our aggression against <clears throat> them. So thank you so much. We'll do some organizing around that. Thank you. Oh, okay. Well, thanks, Jody. That was great. And uh, John, uh, John Parker, my friend, uh, yeah, who's here in LA with his beautiful wife, Maggie. There are a couple to do this together, I'll tell you. Uh, John is a member of the International Peace Delegations, a company uh, by former U.S. Attorney Ramsey Clark that traveled to many countries targeted by U.S. bombings, including Syria and Sudan. He is a member of the Socialist Unity Party and Harriet Tubman Center for Social Justice 
And John, I know you for a long time, and thanks for being here with us tonight. And thanks for all you guys do. Thanks. He's targeted by U.S. bombings, including Syria and Sudan. He is a member of the Socialist Unity Party and Harriet Tubman Center for Social Justice. And John, I know you for a long time, and thanks for being here with us tonight. And thanks for all you guys do. Thanks. I had a picture of um, the highway to death that was uh, the bombing in 1991 in February, the US military jets and helicopters rained napalm and cluster bombs and 30 millimeter shells on convoys of Iraqi soldiers, civilians, refugees, and at least thousand people were burned alive or shot, uh, shot to death while fleeing. Um, Imagine this happening on the 101 or something like that on a highway and you'd see all these cars and, and uh, carnage and um, it just, just to give a picture of what, what U.S. war looks like. Um, you know, the, the pilots called it a turkey shoot, the ones who uh, did that highway of death killings. They said it was like shooting fish in a barrel. And it, it was one of the final acts of the massive bombing by the uh, first Bush administration that was named Operation Desert Storm, where they gave about 89,000 tons of bombs on Iraq, killing hundred over, over hundreds of uh, thousands of people, destroyed the country's oil refineries, power grids, water stations, um, its only plant for baby formula. And, um, it just to uh, make the point that these targets, you know, um, of U.S. imperialism, uh, they have a real uh, human cost, and they're justified by vilification. Um, the latest enemy of the U.S. that's getting in the way of U.S. profits is vilified, and um, but you know, even everything if everything they said to make these wars happen um, is, is true, even if it was true, even though it. It never is an entirety, or if, if at all. Um, just think about how brutal the killings are of the U.S. presidents responsible for the killing of millions, not just once, but in almost every U.S. war from the killing of millions in the Philippines, millions in North Korea, and the combined recent wars of Afghanistan, Iraq, and Libya today. And I didn't even mention Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the death by destabilization, starvation, our drones in Indonesia, Sudan, Congo, and Yemen, and Somalia, and Pakistan. From the U.S., the U.N. now is estimating that 16 million people will die, mostly children, of starvation in Yemen due to the uh, supported war by the U.S. Uh, with Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Um, now, we often accused Syria of using chemical weapons, um, but the fact is the U.S. employs them and pays others including those who are fighting against the government in Syria to use them often. Um, from the usage in Vietnam to the continued use of napalm in Iraq, along uh, with white phosphorus usage and other things. Uh, when I went to Iraq on the delegation there with Ramsey Clark, uh, we visited hospitals and we went there in 2013 after their, their claims of chemical weapon use by Syria. Um, we went there and we, around the hospitals in Damascus, we interviewed victims of sniper attacks and the bombings, and they gave detailed explanations of how they were attacked by the government, by anti-government forces, um, uh, and never mentioned the government forces that were doing this. They said that, that they didn't, that's what the U.S. was and the Western media was telling us, but they had another story. Uh, we spoke to refugees who lost their homes. We heard many stories about kidnappings and ransoms of a million Syrian pounds uh, uh, by anti-government forces. I spoke with a reporter from The Sun in the UK, and she was extremely frustrated that the evidence she found of the then chemical attack in 2013 uh, being blamed on the government, that she had evidence that the so-called rebels were responsible for this. But she couldn't get her words published in the newspaper. Instead, they were taking evidence, so-called evidence, from a person who MI6 had already linked to ISIS, who lives in the UK, supposedly reporting from Syria. Uh, there are many lies that go on, and there are lies about the chemical, so-called chemical attack that supposedly happened in Douma in Syria. 
where uh, many scientists, including Noam and other folks, including Noam Chomsky, and internal reports that WikiLeaks uh, leaked uh, in 2019, saying that um, these reports about chemical attack by Syria were unfounded and weren't compatible with the truth. In fact, the BBC was got caught in a lie and had to recount. Um, BBC editor John Williams published in his blog what amounts to an apology for his news organization's coverage of the Hula massacre that took place in Syria in 2012 in May. It was blamed on the Syrian government, um, but he said he found evidence to the contrary after he'd ordered. Unfortunately, that that, re, that uh, recounting was not publicized nearly as much as the accusation. But he said he quoted some uh, a Western official that he and he said the. Uh, those opposed to President Assad have an agenda, Williams points out. One senior Western official went as far as to describe their uh, YouTube communications the, uh, as brilliant. Uh, he linked them to PSYOPs, brainwashing techniques used by the US and other military to convince people of things that may not necessarily be true. And these lies um, and distortions about Muslim fighting the US being there to fight the Muslim terrorists they had their birth during the Afghanistan intervention under Jimmy Carter. In fact, ISIS, Al Qaeda, Nusra Front, Taliban were all given resources, weapons, and money to thrive. In the Taliban's case, this started with Jimmy Carter's administration, where the Mujahideen fighting the revolutionary government in Afghanistan was given billions in training to become the Taliban that we now know. Um, and this should help folks understand that you know imperialism is systemic. It's not Democratic or Republican Party. But they're all part of this capitalist system of uh, its current capitalist system of imperialism. So when Trump said he was getting out of Syria, this is what really happened. I mean, the the White House had made a tactical shift in an effort to pull Turkey back into the U U.S. and NATO orbit, and um, that shift followed the victories of Syria and its allies and eight years of war over invading mercenary forces armed and paid by the US, Britain, France, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Turkey, and Israel. Um, so while Trump was tweeting about pulling out of Syria, days after several hundred US troops were transferred out of Northern Syria, a US Army armored brigade invaded Eastern Syria and seized the country's oil fields. And Trump said, we're leaving soldiers to secure the oil. <laughs> Uh, he said that uh, um, he is speaking about the estimated 2.5 billion barrels of oil reserves. He said, there's massive amounts of oil. And what I intend to do perhaps is make a deal with Exxon Mobil or one of our great companies to go in there and do it properly. Um, uh, Mark Esper who was the defense secretary at the time threatened to use overwhelming force to keep Syria from using its own oil fields. So on November 6th, November 6th at a White House meeting, Trump and the Pentagon officials agreed to expand the US military mission in Syria. So there goes all that talk about Trump getting out of Syria. Um, meanwhile, US and armed and trained terrorist militias that had been driven from Syria returned under the protection of an invaded, invading NATO Turkish troops. And they attacked villages, murdered civilians and all the other things, that, the horrible things that they did. Um, Trump encouraged the invasion. And on October 9th, uh, October, um, they launched their offensive, Turkey had launched their offensive. And on October 10th, the US vetoed a United Nations Security Council resolution condemning the invasion. So now we have the bombing of Syria and Iraq uh, recently by Biden to supposedly protect or retali retaliate or the latest verbiage, which really amounts to the US enforcing an occupation in Iraq which the government in Iraq said they wanted ended. So why are they there in the first place? Why is the US there in the first place? There are people's forces in Iraq who are trying to get rid of the US presence. And by international law, they have the right, that right, since it's an illegal occupation unwinded by the Iraqi people. Well, this attack by Biden was a statement saying the US doesn't care about international law or sovereignty as long as profits are to be made. And even though the, um, Biden denies it, the Syrian govern, government and media um, report uh, say that 
media is from Syria, all, have also reported that the U.S. coalition has continued to strengthen its illegal presence in northeastern Syria, establishing multiple bases to protect and train allied forces and terrorist organizations operating under their command and to guard oil fields, extracting resources. And it's estimated that about $30 million per month in oil is being stolen by the U.S. again uh, from Syria. Um, many have mentioned how this, I'm going to conclude here, many have mentioned how the uh, the money for war is stolen from what we need in healthcare and food, et cetera. But how are we going to stop them? How do we make them do that? We have to increase our power to challenge their right to run this country. How do we do that? By building our solidarity with each other and all the struggles of people fighting U.S. empire and their police domestically here, whether that be the fight against racist police murder against black and brown people, our indigenous rights, our fight against sexism and LGBTQ oppression, we have to make all these struggles, especially the struggles against racism, as part of the anti-war movement, as an anti-war struggle, so that we can build the unified power necessary to not only stop U.S. war, but in this capitalist system of racism, exploitation, poverty, and war. And hopefully I didn't go too long there. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you so much. Thanks. And for all your and Maggie's excellent organizing here in the LA area. Mm -hmm. Thanks. It will go into the record for sure. Mira, okay, so um so at the top of the hour, hours ago, um, I mentioned I'm uh, with Witness for Peace Southwest. And I want to give a, a shout out to Gail Ferris, who I, I hope was with us for a little bit. She was the founder in 1982, one of the first Latin America solidarity organizations. And Miguel Angel, um, uh, you will hear, um, is we work with him. He's a, an organize, He's we're helping him coordinate. Uh, Miguel Angel was a Honduran student organizer with the Libre Party in opposition to the U.S.-backed coup against President Manuel Zelaya in 2009. Miguel was forced to flee death squads in his country three years ago, led one of the caravans to the U.S. border, the caravan number two, and lived in a U.S. detention center for nine long months. As a matter of fact, three different detention centers. He is... Uh, coordinating with us, Witness for Peace Southwest. I want to tell you we have a couple of tough photos um, that he has submitted for the record. Um, and what we want to come out of this, and he will mention it, but I just want to put it at the top of his talk, is that um, there are elections in November in Honduras. And anyone on this call right now, we are looking to work with all of the people who do this, but to get a delegation, um, we hope to be election observers um, down in November. That is his passion right now to make this happen. Miguel Ángel, tú hablas y yo traduzco. Okay. Mi nombre es Miguel Ángel. Tengo 25 años de edad. Soy un asilado político aquí en este país. My name is Miguel Ángel. I'm 25 years old and I am a political exile here in this country. Soy un joven desplazado por la política de Estados Unidos en Honduras. I am um, a young person who is displaced by the politics of the United States. Desde el dos, cuando yo tenía 13 años, empecé mi activismo por las injusticias que vivía el país. Since I was thir since I've been 13 years old, I've done activism for the injustices in my country. Me metí en todo esto porque Honduras nunca, desde que yo he estado pequeño, no ha sido ni libre, ni soberano, ni independiente. I've been this way because my country, Honduras, since I was a little kid, has never been free, has never been sovereign, have never been independent. Ya que mi país ha sido golpeado muy duro durante décadas, sometidos primero por los españoles y después por la intervención de Estados Unidos en Honduras ya que ellos ponen y quitan presidente. Um, we have had coups and overthrows and control ever since the Spanish, but then after that by the United States that keeps bringing people in and out of power in my country. Uh, tú, eh, Miguel Ángel, tú, tú ves las fotos? Sí. Okay, va pues. En Honduras tuvimos un presidente que se llamó Manuel Zelaya Rosales que en el 2005, 2004, 2006, él prometió que si llegaba a la presidencia, él iba a ayudar a la gente pobre y okay. iba a ser presidente para los pobres. 
Okay, thank you. Um, and so we had a president, Manuel Zelaya, who um, from 2004, 2005, he came into, he was elected president and he promised to be a president for the poor people. Cuando él ingresó a la contienda del con un partido de derecha llamado el Partido Liberal, él fue el candidato. Uh, he was a candidate with the Liberal Party. Él llegó a la presidencia porque la gente lo apoyó porque prometió muchas cosas en el 2006. So in 2006, he promised a lot of things and the people voted for him and he came to power. Cuando él fue presidente, él ayudó y dio todo lo que él prometió, ayudar a la gente pobre, darle casa a la gente pobre, darle semillas a los campesinos para que sembraran y ayudarlos. Okay, ayudarla. and so when he was president, he actually followed through with all of his campaign promises, giving housing to the poor, seeds for the farmers. ¿Qué más políticas? Él hizo muchas, muchas cosas que la embajada americana y la empresa privada con los ricos, le dieron un golpe de estado. Y mencionas más de la de las políticas que él hizo también. Ya. Yeah. Su pasa? política su política era más medicina, más libros, no oh. armas, no violencia. Books, no arms, more medicine. Um, um, help for single women, he, uh, madres solteras. Las madres solteras, él, él, apuraba, él apoyaba con los bonos de dinero para las madres solteras para, para que sus hijos pudieran optar por la educación, que tuvieran un respaldo. So one of his policies was to help single women um, with um, money to help their children, kind of like a universal basic income for single women. Él fue, And... el, el, él fue el mejor presidente de Honduras, por eso le dieron golpe de Estado, porque a los ricos no les gusta que un presidente que tenga un puesto tan grande le dé comida a los pobres que pongan comida en el plato del pobre. Yeah. So, um he was the best president we've ever had, but the wealthy don't like that the someone in such a position of power gives a plate of food to the poor. En el 2009 le dieron golpe de estado, lo cual él tuvo que irse a refugiarse a la embajada de Brasil. And so in 2009, um, there was a coup d'etat against him, and he had to flee into the Brazilian embassy. Después de eso, él se fue para un país de República Dominicana para huir de, de la persecución que le estaban dando los mismos compañeros y la élite en Honduras. And afterwards, he had to flee to the Dominican Republic because of the persecution. Él regresó a Honduras en el 2011 para implantar, crear un partido del pueblo llamado Libertad Refundación. Um, he returned in 2011 to found a new political party in Honduras called the Libre Party. Y como él tenía otros pensamientos buenos, eh, la gente lo apoyó y él armó un partido que en el 2012 ganaron las elecciones y en el 2017 ganaron las elecciones, pero como él no es derechista, a él no lo dejan llegar. Al poder. Yeah. So in 2012, they won elections. In 2017, they won elections and they were fraudulently taken away because we're not allowed to win elections. Y todo eso, las elecciones que se han robado, quitan el sistema, paran el sistema, hackean el sistema para que todos los números, ellos los están fabricando de sus propias computadoras, pero no es la voluntad del pueblo. Yeah. I just want to say quickly, we, we are not allowed to talk about fraudulent elections in this country. In Honduras, um, they, they had a, a blackout. They stopped the counting um, for several days, and we didn't know for 12 days who was the president in 2017, and that doesn't happen in our country. It was fraudulent. Pero todo, todo eso en Honduras lo que ha dejado es luto, madres sol, sin sus hijos, muchos estudiantes muertos, muchos estudiantes presos y, y un 1% de los estudiantes que logran salir con vía de Honduras estamos refugiados en diferentes países. Okay, so I'm trying to get all this. Um, and so um, we leave our country in mourning and there's many uh, mothers killed, many children killed, many young people. And we have many people in the uh, young people, especially who have had to flee in all parts of the country and different countries even. 
Estados Unidos siempre envía mucho dinero a Honduras, pero todo ese dinero que envía solo llegan a las carteras de los ricos y también a, la, a que el gobierno con las Fuerzas Armadas, a financiar las Fuerzas Armadas para darles armas, equiparlos, ¿para qué? Para que maten al pueblo, a como Berta Cáceres, periodistas buenos, estudiantes buenos, una persecución y Estados uh, Unidos. So a lot armando. of American money comes down to Honduras, a lot of money, but it all goes to the rich, it all goes to the military, it all goes to buy arms um, and kill good people like Berta Cáceres and, and harm students like, like us. Ya, ya que los, todos los hay muchos militares que vienen con una ideología de escuadrones de la muerte, que sea el 316 en Honduras, y esos militares fueron entrenados en las escuelas de las Américas, en Georgia. And, yeah. So they, they come in with death squads with a mentality, the, the 316, which is a death squad in my, in my country. All these people are trained by um, School of the Americas. El 99% de los derechos humanos me estuvieron ayudando para que no me asesinaran, ya que Escuadrones de la Muerte estuvieron cerca de arrebatarme mi vida y yo soy una de las pocas personas que pudo salir del país y contar lo que viví y lo que mis compañeros siguen viviendo en Honduras. So this is what I was living. Um, and I was a lead student organizer in the country. I was very well known. And then I became a target also. And so I had to um, leave and 99%, this is, I'm just going to show, we, we do this um, presentation together um, often, and I just want to say this, we, we offer this a longer presentation too. He and I could do this together, or anyone who can translate, but he has a longer presentation too. This is a picture of, um, pe of young people being taken out. And so this is um, what Miguel Angel knew that he was facing. And he had to flee in his own country. He lived for one year. Um, hiding from the death squads, and he says that 99% of the uh, um, human rights workers in Honduras were were helping him to hide him and eventually get him out of the country. Ya en el 2018 tuve que salir en una caravana y huir desplazado de nuestros países por una política que viene desde aquí, desde Estados Unidos, un neoliberalismo que está asesinando el mundo con su ideología de guerra, de armas, querer contro controlar el mundo y nosotros pagando las consecuencias de una guerra fría que nosotros como pueblo no tenemos culpa solo por beneficio de los ricos y arrastrando eso desde de la guerra fría que hoy en día la guerra fría sigue en el mundo y lo estamos viendo con el ejemplo de Mel Zelaya Rosales. Yeah, he says, you know, he says, I had to leave my country because of the politics of this country, because of the politics, um, a warmongering politics, a politics for the, for the rich, a politics that takes over other countries, he says, and the Cold War is continuing. It's in continuing in a country like mine and it's affecting the people who have nothing to do with it. And so I my life was completely changed um, from the Cold War that's still continuing because I had to come on this caravan to come here. Cuando llegué a, a Tijuana con la caravana, cuando, cuando, cuando venía en caravana, con muchas personas de organizaciones y estudiantes de este país y de, y de México, pude abrir un albergue en Tijuana antes so, de entregarme a detención. Yeah. Um, and so he, I just want to say is he was about 22 at the time. He led the second caravan. Like I said, it had about 2000 people. There was no one to lead it. And he just took charge. Um, and when he got to the border of Tijuana, he says many Mexican organizations, U.S. organizations. This is when we met him. Um, my my friend and comrade Tanya uh, Harding uh, hardly uh, met him. And he was able to um, open up a shelter for all of the people and a, and a kitchen and everything. Fue muy, fue muy doloroso ver tantas personas llorar, tristes, dejando su país cuando no queremos abandonar el país. Pero por la persecución que, que en día tenía en Honduras, tuve que salir. Me entregué a detención y cuando yo pedía... Mean, mira, voy a, voy a traducir esa parte. Uh, he says it's so sad to see so many people didn't want to leave their country, but they had to, they were forced to, um, by very, you know, violence or poverty. Um, and, and so then, um, I, uh, 
turned myself into the authorities. I went into detention, out of detention. Ya, ya que en Honduras no los estamos enfrentando contra un partido político, sino contra un narcoestado que está 100% con pruebas de que vivimos en un país donde el narcotráfico es el que reina en Honduras. Yeah, so he's talking about we live under a narco dictatorship right now. Um, this is Juan Orlando Hernandez. They say fuera ho, get out ho. Um, and that's what we're living under right now. Yeah, y, and, Entonces, ¿qué pues, tú, qué estás haciendo? Afuera, cuando yo salgo de detención, que estuve como nueve meses preso por, por algo que, que no tenía, no era un delito entrar sin papeles y me vinieron a meter preso. Pero ahora lo que hago es hablar con muchos congresistas para que apoyen la ley Berta Cáceres para que le quiten la ayuda militarmente a Honduras, ya que Honduras no es un país democrático. Um, and so I was nine months in three different detention centers. He has a whole story of that. Um, very brave young man. He sued ICE. Miguel Angel sued ICE because he was supposed to get um, parole and he was never given parole. So um, he sued them and he had, he now has political asylum. Um, and he's a grantee, which isn't done. So, um, so what he does now is he goes around to, you know, he, different congressional offices and we are asking anyone on the call here um he's willing to you know speak to show up uh, virtually of course and uh this is him you can't see him now but but this is this is him and this is us at uh at Nanette Berrigan's anyone in the harbor area um we have our our representative here so um this is this is his mission for this year especially before the November elections yeah um pues lo que estamos viendo ahorita es la embajadora Heidi Fulton, que cuando ella estaba en el 2017, ella fue al, cuando estaban contando lo, los votos en las transmisiones y todo eso, cuando ella no tenía nada que hacer en, en ese lugar y ella estaba dando validez al fraude en Honduras. Uh, so she... Um... We'll take, we'll take her off. But yeah, she, um, in 2017, she was the ambassador to Honduras. And when they were doing um, counting uh, of the election, she was kind of all over it. And he said she had nothing to do with being down there. She like, she shouldn't have been in anybody's business. And what she was doing was um, giving credence to the fraudulent elections. Um, y ahora la delegación, amor, noviembre. Yeah, en noviembre van a haber elecciones generales para cambiar de presidente pero nosotros sabemos en Honduras que ya que están politizados los poderes del Estado y no contamos con el apoyo de, de este país está en contra de, no, del pueblo ellos quieren seguir haciendo las cosas malas que hacen todos los países necesitamos que una delegación vaya a Honduras en noviembre para que estén denunciando lo que pasa en Honduras y que ven con sus ojos lo que Hace el dinero de ustedes, los militares que financia el gobierno. Yeah, so this country, the United States, is not in support of, you know, what's best for my country. And so we really, really need um, election observers down there because you help make us safe. Um, and there are two um, acts right now, one in the House and one in the Senate. One is the Berta Cáceres Act. And that is active right now in the house. It's been there for a couple of years, but they re kind of activated it. And also there's the um, Honduras anti-corruption uh, Senate bill. And that was just introduced by um, Ed Markley. So, you know, he's, his name is well known, known now. So we're looking for a citizen's delegation, but, you know, anyone who's maybe a staffer or even an elected person, um, to, to go down in November and, and uh, let's all work together for that. Um, eh, Miguel Angel, muchas gracias. Y, y nosotros sabemos que algo muy importante va a venir de, de tu charla hoy porque um, tenemos mucha gente, mucha gente de conciencia en esta llamada y uh, vamos a ayudar a, al mundo y, y a tu país seguro. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I just said that we're, um, we're in solidarity with him I, and there we go. Much has happened since this Cold War Truth Commission was recorded in March of 2021. 
I'm going to take a few minutes to bring us up to date. In a landslide election, the people of Honduras elected Xiomara Castro, wife of the former president Manuel Zelaya, who was ousted in a U.S.-backed coup in 2009, 12 years before. The former president, the military dictator Juan Orlando Hernandez, who was supported by the U.S., has been extradited to the United States for drug trafficking. In a speech to the General Assembly of the U.N., President Castro said, quote, Never again will we carry the stereotype of a banana republic. We will put an end to the monopolies and oligopolies that only impoverish our country. We poor nations of the world will no longer tolerate coups d'etat. We will no longer tolerate the use of lawfare or color revolutions, which are usually organized to plunder our extensive natural resources. Unquote. The return of the Zelayas and democracy to Honduras is part of a wider resurgence of leftist or progressive governments in Latin America called the Pink Tide that have swept out U.S.-supported right-wing governments over the last four years. These include Colombia, where Gustavo Pedro, a former guerrilla leader, was elected president in June of this year. Chile, where Gabriel Boric, the most left-wing president in almost 50 years, won the presidential vote in December 2021, promising to, quote, bury, unquote, the neoliberal economic model left by General Augusto Pinochet's dictatorship. Peru, where Pedro Castillo, a teacher and a union leader, won the presidency in 2021. Bolivia, where Luis Arce of the Movement to Socialism Party was elected president in 2020, and Argentina, where Alberto Fernandez won in 2019, supported by a left-leaning coalition of parties. In 2018, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, AMLO, scored a landslide victory in the Mexican general elections. And most importantly, Lula da Silva, leader of the Workers' Party, PT, has now regained the presidency in Brazil. Zia Mar Castro's plan includes immediate hunger relief for the poorest of the population, the demilitarization of security, addressing the energy sector, and floating the idea of a national constitutional assembly. And so... The barbaric imperialists have their work cut out for them.